Today we're going to finish the message that we started last week about hope. And God's been putting on my heart to talk about hope because, you know, the statistics for suicide are going through the roof. Hopelessness is all around us. You know, all this violent crime. You know, this policeman that was just shot in Riverside County, they had his service yesterday. He was a man of God. He went to Abundant Life Church. He had two children and a pregnant wife. And he just went up to this house to do a domestic call. And the guy just shot him as he's walking up to the house. They had this huge service yesterday. Actually, NBC covered it very well. The local news showed testimonies at his church and from his pastor, how he was a man of God. But a hopeless person shoots a cop. You know what I'm saying? Because he has no reason to live. He's just like, I'm just going to shoot this cop. I don't care about his life. I don't care about my life. So God is calling us to be a beacon of hope, a ray of hope, right? Um, and so that's why we're going to go through, this, through Psalm 23. You, and as you turn there, I would like to pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for Church on the Beach. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us hope that we can wake up every morning and open our eyes and not be hopeless as David Crosby and Crosby Stills Nash Young once sang, helplessly hoping. We're not helplessly hoping. We are hoping with great joy and expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, David Crosby just died. All you old hippie guys like me, and he was a fantastic musician. He desperately needed Jesus. He was a heroin and cocaine addict and alcoholic his whole life, and he doesn't know how he survived till 81 but he just died. And he did sing that song, helplessly hoping. We sit by the window and wonder. Well, no, we don't do that. We have Jesus, right? So I'm going to review what we did last week real quick and get down to where we finished. So verse 1 in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in need. Well, that's what it says in the New American Standard, which I teach from. The King James version says, I shall not want, right? We talked about that last week. How is that showing that we can have hope? Well, number one, he's going to provide for us. I will not be in need. <clears throat> I might not get my wants necessarily, but I'll have my needs met. And there's verses there to look up. Verse two, he lets me lie down. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Second point we brought up last week is the Lord brings rest and contentment. We as believers can rest assured, guys, we're okay. Everything's going to be okay. Look at your neighbor and say, everything's going to be okay. Relax. His burden is light, right? We know He's going to take care of us. I had this, when I was thinking about this last night, it's like when my mom or my dad used to tuck me into bed, and I just felt like everything was going to be okay. You know, not everybody had that when they were young. I understand that. But for me, that's a great memory of my mom or my dad reading to me and tucking me into bed. Just let me know everything's going to be okay. And they just really put that in me. My mom, they are believers, you know. There's nothing better than being restful and content. You know, I've always told my class, my kids in my class, if you can settle yourself and just sit there and not have to do anything, then everybody will love you, <laughs> especially teachers. But that comes from just knowing everything's going to be okay. I don't have to I go do so. I have to go do something. You know, I can just sit here. I'm okay. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to drink something or smoke something or watch something or listen to something or walk somewhere. I can just stop, and I'm okay. You know, the Lord does that for us. We have hope. Verse 3, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He will restore my soul. Praise God for that. How many needed restoring? All right? Humpty Dumpty had, sat on the wall. He had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men could not put him back together again, but Jesus can. Right? That's the second part of the story. He restored our soul. He got, and then He guides us. And then His guidance gives Him glory. For his name's sake, he gets the glory. So that led us to point number three in our notes. The Lord will equip us for our mission. 
We, these quotes I read last week, these are really good. Rest is to fit for work, and work is to sweeten rest. He does that for us. He gives us the rest so that we can work, and then we have a good work in His name, and then we can rest and put our head on our pillow and have a nice sleep. Another quote, joy in God is the strength of work for God, but work for God is a perpetuation of joy in God. Right? So, when you have joy, you have strength to do it to serve Him, and then when you serve Him, you get joy, and it makes you want to serve Him again. And it's this wonderful, beautiful snowball all in the right direction. Amen? Amen. So, of course, if you don't have that, you become the downward spiral like the Smashing Pumpkins sang about years ago. And who want, you don't want to get into the downward spiral, into the drain, and that's where people kill themselves, right? They just lose hope. God provides rest for us so we can serve Him. We all have a mission, a call. I take great hope in this, y'all, knowing that I have purpose. That's why when Rick Warren wrote that book, A Purpose Driven Life, he sold millions of copies because people are, did, want to know they have purpose. I have a reason for being. I'm not just this random production of this myth called evolution. This crazy theory that has no evidence, you know, that Darwin came up with to try to remove God from the equation. So, people who don't know their purpose lose hope. There's a, a suicide every 11 and a half minutes in the United States. So while we're having this message, you know, there's going to be about six people that kill themselves across the country because they have lost hope or they're addicted to opioids or something and they emotionally can't find a way out. But we can help those guys find a way out. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year old Americans. The third leading cause. And I said last week, what's the first leading cause of death around the world last year? Abortion. Abortion. 73 million babies. 73 million. And our government funds it. Wow. Woo, I would not want to be them when they die and face Jesus. So it's so interesting. I don't know. Google it. Um, good question. So, but, um, and then last night, I mean, last week it was so interesting. I'm giving this message, and without identifying this person by name, this guy came and stood in the back last week, and I was just watching him back there. And at the end of the service, he came up to me, and I was introduced to him. And he came down here because his father had just committed suicide in November, and he came down to this spot, to, to the place where his dad taught him how to surf. He's from Playa del Rey. And he didn't know we were gonna be here, he didn't know I was gonna be preaching, and he certainly didn't know I was gonna be teaching on hope and suicide. Coincidence? No, not a coincidence at all. I looked at him, I said, God loves you so much that he had you come here today to hear this message and be with us so that you could be the person in your family right now that has hope. His dad worked with a band called the Suicidal Tendencies for years, okay? And he actually became a believer at the end and things got, just things went sideways. He lost hope. But how cool that he came so that he can take hope back to his dad's brothers and sisters, to his uncles and aunts, to the grandkids, and say, no, 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 we have hope. Jesus is the answer for the world today, right? Like the old song. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. Enter all the singers. Could turn into a musical. And then, so, I've been surfing at a secret spot down that way. I don't want to give it away. Somewhere over there. Been getting killer barrels, so amazing. So I got out of the water and I went over to this little bench and these other retired guys are there in the middle of the day like me. And we started a conversation with this guy who's been sitting on that bench for 40 years. And unfortunately right now there's a big dune there that the tractor pushed up, so his view is blocked. But he sits on that place every day, 40 years. So I start talking about hope and talking about Jesus because it's my favorite subject. Turns out his father committed suicide. So I was able to speak into his life and give him hope when his father committed suicide. 
So then I finish talking to those guys and I go up the hill to my car and there's a guy parked right next to me. Great, had a great conversation with this guy for about an hour. Musician, carpenter guy. And we ended up having a really amazing talk because his mother committed suicide when he was six. So I've just been running into these people one after one after another, one after another. And I was able to speak into this guy's life and tell him that Jesus is hope and he said he wants to come to our church. So cool. But you see, and when that happened to me, it's so exciting to me because then I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. Do you know what I'm talking about? And we're talking about what we're supposed to be talking about right now. And when I was with those guys, I was over there where I was, even though I was going surfing, right, to the gym. That's my gym. God had other plans for that morning, right? And that's our mission, to be open, to know who's around you and start conversations. Do the three-foot rule. If somebody's within three feet, ask them, so what's up? What do you do for a living? What do you, you know, what do you like to do? Start a conversation. Find out about them. They could be right on the brink. And you'll save their life. Amen. We talked about how hope brings great benefits in life. I won't read them all because we read them last week, but a couple of the high points from psychology today. Hope may benefit physical health by boosting immune function and decreasing pain. Hope is linked to lower levels of anxiety and depression and helps protect against those conditions. And being hopeful does not mean forcing yourself to be positive. I thought that was very insightful. You're not like just faking it till you make it. No, we have a reason for hope. No, I'm, I'm hopeful, really. Well, if you don't have substance to that statement, when it gets hard again, then you're going to collapse again, right? Instead, it involves... A, acknowledging a full realistic picture of the world living in truth not in denial okay not in Egypt on a river in denial <laughs> lost in the world so point number four the Lord will guide us praise the Lord that should give you great hope that you have guidance we're not left alone like a lost sheep the Lord will lead us on the right path you guys we can learn to hear His voice leading us. Amen. This gives me great hope. Great hope. And I put the verses there. We looked at them last week. Then verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So there was a German shepherd, a Doberman, and a cat that died. In heaven they faced God who wanted to know what they believed in. So the German shepherd said, I believe in discipline, loyalty, and training to my master. Good, said God. You may sit on my right side. The Doberman said, I believe in love, care, and protection of my master. Aha, you may sit on my left, says God. Then God looked at the cat and said, what do you believe in? And the cat replied, I believe you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. So, so you can count on a dog for protection, but not a cat, which reminds me of another story. And I've said this before, but it cracks me up. A man broke into a house one night. His goal was to take something small and valuable. While he was searching through the stuff, he heard a small voice. Jesus is watching you. He stopped for a moment and said to himself, this must be a voice from my old Sunday school. So he continued searching. About five minutes later, he heard the voice again. Jesus is watching you. He turned his flashlight to the direction and he saw a parrot. He said to the parrot, what's your name? The parrot replied, Moses. And the robber then said, what kind of silly people would name their parrot Moses? Uh, the parrot looked up and said, the same people who named their pit bull Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so... But there's nothing better than Jesus himself protecting us. Amen? Amen? Ultimately, we are protected. He's our great shepherd. He's going to protect us until our time on earth is up. You know, people right now are wondering, how did that cop get killed? He was loving the Lord. He had just become a deputy. He's so excited about his new job. Well, God, we'll just let that be with the Lord. He's now with Jesus. 
okay? And now because of that, this is my first thought right now, when the seed, when the seed of wheat is planted in the ground, it gives life, right? So his life being planted now is going to bring change and things happening in that part of Riverside County and Marietta and those places where, he, where he's from. And I'm sure people are going to love on his wife and his kids. And t- they're going to love bomb them. And there, she'll be in a wonderful community. God will help them. But the point is, he's going to protect us until it's time to go home. We don't know when that is, but he does. So I have great assurance in that. Number six, the Lord will comfort us. This gives me hope that I don't have to fear when I'm in the shadow of death. He's going to comfort me in that difficult time. And I talked about last week when I worked with gang members and how God protected me in some very tense moments when I was with gang members. We have hope, you guys. And then verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. That leads me to number seven. The Lord will sustain us in times of trouble. The Lord will sustain us in times of trouble. Look at Psalm 9 in your Bible. Psalm 9. Verses 9 through 10. Cold fingers don't fail me now. Wow. Okay. Okay, here we go. 9 says, The Lord will also be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not abandoned those who seek you. I find great solace in that. And then if you look over at Psalm 55, 22, Psalm 55, 22, reads, cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. And then in Proverbs 23, if you look over at Proverbs 23, verse 17, Do I have to lick my finger like old people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Do not, let your, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Certainly there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. So God is going to take care of us. And then Isaiah 40, 31 is a famous verse that's good to note in your Bible. And I, the whole chapter of Isaiah 40 is amazing. Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And then 41, 10 reads... Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I appreciate that, I will carry you. I have done it, and I will bear you, and I will carry you, and I will save you. These verses give me great hope. He's not going to leave us. Matthew Henry has written, The Lord's people feast at His table upon the provisions of His love. Satan and wicked men are not able to destroy their comforts. I read these things time and time again. Right now I'm reading a book called Between Two Tigers about Vietnamese Christians serving the Lord in North Vietnam, constantly being comforted in the presence of their enemies, no matter what the enemy tries to do. While they are anointed with the Holy Spirit and drink the cup of salvation which is ever full. The friends of God are made to triumph in the very presence of their foes. 
Their enemies are compelled to see how he interposes on their behalf. When, when God intervenes on our behalf in the face of our enemies, it speaks to them. They cannot deny it. The believer's final triumph in the day of judgment will be in their very presence of all their assembled enemies, for in their very presence he will pronounce a sentence which will make their eternal happiness sure. Now, I've been reading in Voice of the Martyrs magazine, and um, it's a really powerful story here called A Daughter's Hope Restored. And if you want to get this magazine, go to vom.org, and uh, it's a free subscription. There is this lady named Edosa, E-D-O-S-A. When she was a teenager, her polygamous father died, leaving behind three wives and 15 children. Her Muslim mother soon remarried, and after giving birth to two children with her new husband, she kicked her out of the house. Wow, great. Thanks, Mom. And then, with no place to live, she moved in with an uncle who allowed her to stay on condition that she worked full-time as a housemaid. While she was with her uncle, at this time she's 19, she heard the gospel during a visit to a church. She came to faith in Christ, but she was beaten by her aunt and kicked out of her house again. Then, this is typical in the country of Benin, B-E-N-I-N, in Africa, um, where a majority of people, uh, Majority of the people practice traditional religions and are Muslim. So after being kicked out for a second time, she lived on the streets for months before a Muslim woman offered her a place to live and job as a cleaner. Eventually, she had to sneak out of the house to attend church. And when she returned, her employers beat, employers beat her again. Talk about a rough childhood, right? Adosa had been promised 20,000 West African francs, which is $31 a month, but instead of paying Adosa the woman the, the agreed upon wages, this woman mocked her and she said, Go to Jesus, he'll provide for you. So, after working for seven years, seven years, she started to waver in her faith. Like, where is God in all this, right? Wouldn't you be a little discouraged? She was weakened by sorrow and difficulties. She's thinking, where is Jesus? I've chosen to follow him, but he hasn't come to save me. Then Adosa began to read God's word with her pastor's wife, who provided encouragement and served her as a mentor in her faith. She told me to stand fast. Stand fast. Trust the Lord. Jesus is still at work in your life. He's not left you. So, then she asked for a birth certificate so she could get a job, right? And this lady refused to give her a birth certificate, and so she took her to court. And then it took two court appearances to resolve the situation. The prosecutor became so angry at her employer, during one hearing he threatened to send her to prison for withholding her salary and her birth certificate. So, but Edosa still loved the Lord, and she decided to show this woman grace. Can you imagine how much that spoke to her? She said, I don't want the money. I just want my certificate, right? Which is better than having the money. I just want to work. Okay? I have, she says, I have Jesus in my heart, and the money does not matter to me. So still, after all this time, she's trusting the Lord. Jesus has a hold of her heart. The judge ordered the woman to give her this birth certificate. Then she gave her the birth certificate outside the, the court, and then she beat her and kicked her out of her house so she's homeless for the third time she's living on the streets and then a sewing academy let her sleep in one of the workshops she learned that then voice of the martyrs these guys learned of her plight right learned of her plight they, they provided her with a sewing machine and tools a motorcycle to help her get to church a rented building where she could live and work all of a sudden just her world just turned in a moment with the help of believers. She was overwhelmed by the support she received from the global body of Christ. When I saw everything that belonged to me, she says, I didn't know what to say. I just started crying. I was very, very happy and grateful to God. I think that's the understatement of the year after knowing what she went through, right? A small tailoring operation has developed for, because of this into a thriving business. She now employs five young women as apprentices. Her business is growing. 
She's taken the opportunity to tell others about God and how He worked in her life because of the testimony. And one day, this is the part about his prote- uh, preparing a table in the presence of our enemies. One day, her former boss parked in front of the shop and just sat there. The one that used to beat her, right? Kicked her out. When Adosa went out to greet her, the woman didn't get out of the car or acknowledge her. She's like, couldn't even get out of the car and acknowledge what God had done in her life, right? Still for Adosa, that moment was a testimony of the Lord's ability to provide for and defend His people. Amen? He will defend us. especially against those who persecute believers because of their faith in Christ. She says, now my life has been restored and she has hope. My faith has come back. I now believe that the Lord can rescue. I just had to be patient. Well, I don't know that any of us had that kind of patience. But in Africa, in their situation, her 10, you know, 10, 15 years, she waited that's it. What's that song? I waited. And what, what's that, the old Hope Chapel song? And the Lord heard my cry, right? Praise the Lord. So, verse 6 reads in Psalm 23, Certainly goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life, just like it did for Edosa. And my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. This leads us to our last point. We can trust the Lord for His mercy and faithfulness all the days of our life. God will continue to show us mercy and faithfulness as we dwell in His house. When we live a life of service to God, we find ourselves dwelling in that house. That's what this is talking about. Jesus will fill us with His Spirit and draw us close. Look at Isaiah 30, 18. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those, are all those who long for Him. He's going to take care of us. And then Lamentations 3, verse 22 to 24, which I often quote in the mornings. 3, 22 to 24. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for His compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I wait for Him. I have hope. I'm going to keep waiting no matter how hard finances get, no matter how hard my emotional stresses get, no matter how hard things get at work, no matter how hard sickness may come into my life, I will continue to wait on the Lord who will restore me. Amen? Amen. 1 Peter 5 comes to mind. After you suffer for a little while, He will strengthen and confirm and establish you. And who gets the glory? He does. He gets the glory, not by pulling up our bootstraps. Who has bootstraps anyway? And no bootstraps to pull on. We need Jesus. And then in Hebrews 4, if you turn over to Hebrews 4, verse 14, as we're getting close to the end here. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, This whole section is talking about Jesus as our high priest who made a way for us by dying for us, by being the sacrifice once and for all to pay for our sins. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He felt everything when he was on earth, y'all but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in the time of our need. 
Don't stop going to Jesus. We have hope. He's going to take care of us. God will continue to show His mercy and His compassions every morning. Here's a quote from Barnes. We are not to suppose of David that he anticipated such a residence in or near the tabernacle of the house of God. This is not a real building necessarily, but he anticipated and desired a life as if he dwelt there, as if he was there, as if he was constantly engaged in holy occupations. His life would be spent as if in as if in the constant service of God. His joy and peace and religion would be as if he were always within the immediate dwelling place of the Most High. This should be the desire of every true, true child of God, you guys. Wishing to live, worshiping, being uh, in holy things, because we find peace and joy as we serve the Lord. In a very important sense, it is a Christian's privilege so to live even on earth, it will certainly be his privilege so to live in heaven and full of grateful exultation and joy. Every child of God may adopt this language as his own. God, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life as I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So people may ask, may look at my life and ask me, maybe ask you, so why do you go to the church all the time? Why do you have to go to church? Why do you have to have to listen to worship music? Oh, we're worshiping again? You're going to sing another song? You know, don't you want to do something else? Why do you always have to listen to Christian music? I mean, seriously? I mean, that's so legalistic, right? Why do you have to read Christian books? Why do you have to be a Christian biography? Can't it be? I mean, Steve Jobs is interesting, right? Well, why, is it have, why do you have to want to read John Wesley? Why do you want to read George Whitfield? Why is that? Why do you want to find out what God wants to do with you? Why not just go pick something good? I mean, pick a great adventure around there. Why just pick something? There's great things to do in the world. Why do you want to do what God wants you to do? These are good questions, aren't they, right? Why do you want to know your call? What is so important about all that? Why? It's because when you live like that, you will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. Come on, y'all. You will dwell in the house of the Lord full of peace and joy and be filled with His Spirit continually. Continually. We just read that on uh, Thursday night in our house. Acts 13, 52. After the disciples, the apostles went through all this stuff going on and, and they, at the end of the day, they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit continually and moved on to the next mission. That's what life brings. We can smile at the future. That's what the Proverbs 31 woman said in verse 25. She smiles at the future. Can you smile at the future right now? I believe you can because we have hope. It looks bright for us, y'all. Even though everything on earth can go sideways, it's bright for us. Look at your neighbor and say, the future is bright. The future is bright. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. If you believe, you can have hope. And we believe, it's like a jump, side angle, side. If you, if you believe, you can have hope. Since we believe, that means we have hope. It's like, it's a proof text, right? C.S. Lewis said, there are better things ahead than any we leave behind. Isn't that good? There's better things ahead than any we leave behind. Behind. 